From the moment you take your first steps on your new save to when you're relaxing in your base with that newly found generator running outside, you might have wondered, how did this all start? Well, I'm here to answer that question. With a timeline explaining what caused the zombie apocalypse in Project Zomboid. For future reference, this timeline is based off the game as of build 41.78. Something important to note is that the date during which you, the player, start the game is July 9th, 1993. But the timeline starts weeks prior. Residents notice a foul smell in the air. What this smell is, is unknown. July 1st, 1993. Knox Telecommunications take phone lines down for maintenance. July 6th, 1993. The military set up blockades creating the exclusion zone and evacuate some residents from it. The exact size of this zone is unknown. However, the zone is smaller than the one we can find in-game and it covers Muldraw and West Point and is below the Ohio River. July 8th, 1993. Richard Gershwin, the news anchor for WBLN, attempts to enter the exclusion zone with his field team. He does so by meeting up with a driver from West Point. They are stopped and arrested by the military who are guarding the exclusion zone. July 9th, 1993. 6 a.m. The exclusion zone is reported on the news. The host of NNR states that this disease is an influenza-like, rendering the afflicted unconscious. Soldiers in hazmat suits are spotted along the boundary of the exclusion zone. City workers wearing hygiene masks are seen on the New York subway, and demonstrations occur in Washington. Jackie from LBMW reports that people who try to leave the exclusion zone are denied exit by the military. Scientists are present within the zone. There are even boats patrolling the Ohio River. Officials remain silent on the impact of the outbreak, describing it as non-lethal. Kirsty Cormick from Triple N reports live from South Louisville, stating that roads are blocked by the military. She interviews displaced families from a community that formed in South Louisville. Panic and confusion fills the camp of refugees. They state that phone lines are still out. Joan, working from the studio of Triple N, speculates that there is another reason the phone lines are down other than the long-planned improvement works. Army officials are thought to be setting up quarantine areas and scientific test areas within the perimeter. Richard and his field team are released thanks to Triple N. 12 p.m. General McGrew's speech gets broadcast across all news channels and stations. He confirms that there is an outbreak and that it's flu-like, leading to panic and confusion, but is not yet identified, that there is no evidence of fatalities within the exclusion zone, and that warning shots have been fired, but no civilians were harmed. The no-fly zone remains in place. 6 p.m. General McGrew's speech is repeated across all news channels and stations. The President's message, addressing the exclusion zone and the whole situation at hand, is also broadcast. July 10th, 1993. Midnight. Jeff, former chief scientist at the CDC and guest on NNR Radio, warns listeners that America isn't ready and that, quote, there's more to it than we are told, unquote. Frank Hemingway from LBMW reads a statement in which General John McGrew apologizes for a lack of clarity for what he calls the Knox event. Daniel Sinclair from Triple N, reporting from Washington, states that Republicans are in uproar due to the lack of action from the government. Retired Lieutenant General Jim Deacon appears as a guest on the show Talk the Night and affirms that the Knox event is under control and in good hands. 6 a.m. Protests arise in Washington due to the lack of information presented. Entry is denied to the mall, causing protesters to march towards the White House, and the president keeps attending meetings with the CDC. 12 p.m. The number of protesters in Washington grows to a huge amount. Violence starts to ramp up, with one protester throwing a firebomb. All of which is recorded by Daniel and his cameraman. Low-flying aircraft takes off and some of them are from inside the exclusion zone. Tension rises between people staying in the military camps as they receive barely enough food, sleep rough, and are constantly being watched by the military. Fights start to break out. 6 p.m. The protests in Washington is still ongoing, with 20 individuals under arrest. The military insists that the spread of the disease in the exclusion zone has slowed. Panic buying ensues, leaving some shelves and stores empty. 
except for the meat, since rumors circulate that the disease is in the meat. July 11th, 1993, midnight. Protests arise in Detroit and Los Angeles. Stores are looted and a building is set on fire in LA and fights occur with police in Detroit and Washington. 6 a.m. The president releases another statement with no useful information. Gunshots can be heard coming from the exclusion zone. Rumors and officially released photographs from inside the exclusion zone cause tension and anger to rise in the camps along the boundary. Panic buying and looting continued to escalate. It is reported that no corner of the United States is unaffected by the chaos. Protests continue with more buildings being set aflame and fighting in the streets and arrests rise. 12 p.m. The president releases another statement regarding the decision to ground all flights leaving the United States. The president states that the tests on those recovering from the sickness are inconclusive. Panic buying has turned to looting in many states. Pictures are released showing the army mobilized and rolling into major cities to combat civil unrest. 6 p.m. All flights leaving the United States have been grounded. Police and military personnel patrol the streets, encouraging people to, quote, stay indoors where possible, do not panic, unquote. The exclusion zone boundary is being widened. As General John McGrew puts it, to remove any element of doubt, and that the Knox event is being dealt with safely and responsibly. Pictures are released to LBMW, showing crowded streets in the exclusion zone, suggesting that, despite the sickness looming in the zone, some people are living as normal. Rumors circulate on Judge Matt Hass's show on Triple N that those who try to escape the exclusion zone are killed. July 12, 1993, midnight. There's a confirmed fatality in New York many injured in Miami, as well as a standoff between armed locals and police forces in Missouri, which has been calmed with water cannons and tear gas. All of this from the continued violent protests. With that, the exclusion zone has been widened. Camps were moved back and people evacuated to local buildings. Some refugees were moved forcibly. Violent protests occur in New York City Hall, causing NYPD to use water cannons. Military servicemen within police ranks were noticed. Temporary military installations are set up in central city locations, in Central Park, downtown LA, Miami Beach, and more. 6 a.m. Another statement from the president has been released, announcing a curfew, which will be from 6 p.m. in New York, Miami, and LA. The president also takes responsibility for, quote, the perceived lack of communication, unquote. 6 p.m. A photo from the exclusion zone surfaces of a 30-year-old man in a crowded street with bloodstained clothing, missing arm, and covered in bike marks, seemingly unconcerned at his severe injury, which confirms that there is violence within the exclusion zone. There is an instance of a man suffering from the infection attacking another orally. Refugees in camps close to the boundary of the exclusion zone, as well as soldiers, seem to lose hope. July 13, 1993 Midnight. All news stations suffer from communication issues. However, LBMW radio and Triple N managed to broadcast a couple of words, some of which indicate flights occurred, possibly from or to the exclusion zone. 6 a.m. Further details emerge of violence in the exclusion zone. Those affected from the sickness quote-unquote hunt those who are unaffected. Questioned officials refused either to confirm or deny these revelations. A military base inside Knox, in the exclusion zone, had been overrun with the infected. They are described as, like in the photos, and that they went crazy. Some refugees managed to escape the base, one of which is interviewed on LBMW radio. Another was interviewed on Triple N. She calls the sickness like a plague, and, quote, it kills you, but you're not gone, unquote. They are also described to, quote, bite and maul, unquote, by Richard on WBLN. 12 p.m. Radio and news channels confirm that the infection is spread through fluid exchange. After contact, there is a variable incubation period, after which the victim will attack those who aren't infected. Jackie from LBMW locks herself in a room and informs the listeners that this might be the final broadcast from the journalist herself. This is due to her giving information on the sickness from the exclusion zone, which was not meant to go out. 
Anger rises in camps on the boundary and the military pull back into their checkpoints. 6 p.m. General John McGrew's news statement is played on all news channels and stations. He denies that those who are infected are dead and that they are establishing the likelihood of discovering a cure. July 14, 1993. Midnight. Violent protests continue across the United States, including in cities where the 6 p.m. curfew was present. Professor Peter Ensley appears as a guest on Don Stevenson's show, Talk the Night. He recommends the show's viewers to like the video and subscribe to the channel. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I don't know what got over me. He speculates that the sickness is a prion disease, misfolded prions that can be found in the meat sold in stores. 6 a.m. Refugees in a camp on the boundary of the exclusion zone begin protesting, and the military open fire on two refugees, killing them after which the military start pushing back the refugees with warning shots and tear gas. Distant gunfire and explosions can be heard from inside the exclusion zone. 12 p.m. Chaos continues on the boundary of the exclusion zone, with news channels losing contact with their field team reporters, with only Jackie J from LBMW able to broadcast, but not for long. The president releases a statement amidst the chaos on the boundary, demanding calm. 6 p.m. Fights continue on the boundary of the exclusion zone, which brings the attention of hundreds of the infected from inside the exclusion zone, who then overrun the camp. Reporter Frank Hemingway is attacked by the infected. Jackie locks herself indoors and survives the night. Reporter Richard Gershwin is attacked and bitten by the infected. July 15th, 1993. 6 a.m. The military abandons the camp that was overrun. Supposedly thousands of people in cars or on foot pull back alongside the army. Reports of violence in Louisville arise. 12 p.m. Residents of Louisville try to evacuate towards the north, away from the overrun camp. Huge lines form at gas stations. Symptoms of the sickness start to appear in people who haven't had any contact with the infected. 6 p.m. The number of those who become infected without fluid exchange drastically increases. Thousands of people are affected without fluid exchange. July 16, 1993. Midnight. Mass movement from Louisville on major roads delay emergency teams. A rumor spread on LBMW that not everyone gets the illness. The infection keeps spreading throughout Kentucky, especially further north. The number of civilians infected keep rising. Interstate movement is being reduced by having key bridges and river crossings blocked. 6 a.m. It is highly encouraged to hide. The sickness spreads further to Louisville. Suspected cases appear throughout surrounding states. Kirsty Cormick reports that her camera guy has the infection, but Kirsty herself says she's fine. Broadcasts from WBLN suddenly stop. 12 p.m. Suffering and pain scatters across Louisville as hospitals become full and incapacitated people lie across the streets. Jackie J broadcasts that she has the Knox event infection without fluid exchange with the infected. Symptoms similar to those of the Knox event are reported in the United Kingdom and Somalia. From anecdotal evidence, it is believed that some people may be immune. Yet again, all news channels encourage people to hide and not fight. July 17th. 1993. 6 a.m. The Knox event infection is confirmed in all of Kentucky, Cincinnati and Columbus, Ohio, Norfolk, Newcastle and London, England, Mogadishu, Somalia, Seoul, South Korea, and Okinawa, Japan. The cause of the spread is unknown. Jonas Underwood finds Jackie, who has turned and ends her suffering, as well as overtakes broadcasts from LBMW from now on. 12 p.m. A pre-recorded message from General John McGrew is broadcast on NNR. He addresses those unaffected by the infection. He states that the disease will only spread to them through fluid contact, such as bites, and encourages them to fight back against the infected. To end the message, he says, quote, You have not been forgotten. We will come for you. Unquote. The same message is spread by Jonas on the LBMW for the immune to, quote, bear arms against this threat, unquote. Triple N suffers from communication issues. July 18th, 1993. Midnight. General John McGrew's pre-recorded message is repeated on NNR. Jonas broadcasts that he and his group are surrounded by the infected, but safe. 
After the communication issues, Triple N suddenly stops broadcasting. 6 a.m. The Knox event infection is confirmed in New Orleans, New York, LA, Berlin, and Tokyo. 6 p.m. The final broadcast from Jonas is short as his group gets overrun by the infected. July 19th, 1993, midnight. NNR's final broadcast comes from Pastor James Hartnell, who gets attacked by the infected. Throughout the whole day, an emergency broadcast is played 12 times on LBMW. This wavelength has been chosen for emergency broadcast. The spread of the Knox event infection is now total. Stay in small groups. Do not travel. Assume all major urban areas have been compromised. We are doing all we can to reclaim American soil. We will come for you. This broadcast will be set to repeat. All further updates will be broadcast on this frequency. Good luck. These mark the final broadcasts on LBMW. July 20th, 1993. 6 p.m. A recorded broadcast from Kirsty Cormick is played on Triple N. She addresses those who are immune that, quote, it all rests on them, unquote. Some lines suggest that Kirsty is infected or is under attack from the infected. July 21st, 1993, 6 a.m. Kirsty's recorded broadcast is played twice more, this time being Triple N's final broadcast. From this point on, all channels and stations, apart from the automated emergency broadcast system, are completely offline. The player is left with silence and a loss of hope to seeing the world they once knew return to normal.